Thanks, Louise. The frightening part, ladies and gentlemen, it's just me standing between you and lunch. So, and added to that, some management of expectations that I gave you in between that I would answer a few of, the or of your questions in my presentation. And it's getting worse because um, my title is CIO, which means Chief Inspiration Officer. So it's getting tricky now. I hope you stay with me. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Holland. Holland actually is two provinces, but everybody recognizes the logo. It's not like the maple leaf for Canada, which is a great national symbol. We actually claim the color some 400 years ago, and we got away with it. It's amazing. Um, so I'm proud to, uh, to speak on behalf of the nation. Just to give you a new perspective, um, if you land in Amsterdam at the airport, actually capable of having Boeing 747s and stuff, the only one we have, and you take a car and you drive for one hour and 20 minutes, you're in Germany. Uh, if you take a car from here down south, I heard yesterday, uh, you can drive for 22 hours, you're in Florida. If you go to the other direction, you can drive for 22 hours, you will still be in Ontario. <laughs> so, it's just to, you know, it's not so big a country, and the, the picture of you was very deceptive from that point of view. Um, I had a question from Louise. Uh, CEO is Chief Inspiration Officer. A TKI is a top consortium for knowledge and innovation. This has to do with the change in government policy and how we actually run uh, research uh, by spending public money. Um, I'm not going to say that it is very important, but it's the only legal entity now that gets money to run research, both uh, fundamental and applied for uh, nine top sectors. One of the top sectors is agri and food. And then the word innovation. Um, the entity I'm coming from, Food Nutrition Delta, has a, a board and over 50% of the board is business. And of that business, over 50% is SME. And they didn't like the basic idea of lengthy discussions on semantics and within 10 minutes, we actually came up with this definition here. Once you accept that, a lot of things fall into place, and it's not so difficult to work with innovations anymore. Actually, I'm still waiting for new services. There was none in the past five years. But new product on the shelf, so you can buy it, or on your plate, through out of home, or a new process in which the products were made. That's it. It can't. It can be a lot more complex, but this is what we worked with. Um, this is actually my PowerPoint, and uh, the good news is that the take-homers are in the beginning, and there will be a few in the end, and after that I start telling stories, and after that even more. And then some data uh, specifically for the public uh, officials who are in the audience, what, how did we do it? <coughs> the status of the program, some conclusions, and then if there is time, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Why would a normal person work in the food sector? And I think Woody Allen touched on that really, really very well. He said, we have three existential questions in life. Why are we on this planet? Where do we go? And what time do we eat? So in my country, we're facing 17 million experts on food who take 200 eating decisions per day. Think about that. This is your business. Ain't that great? Now, he's an American, and not, not a bad word of you, about your neighboring country, but um, in Europe, you have to add to that, what do we eat, where does it come from, and personally, I always add, which wine do we choose to go with it? But that's a touchy subject in Canada. I learned that yesterday. Uh, what it was, and what it is now, I'll touch upon later, it was part of the innovation program that we ran for five years. Uh, the take-homer here is quite important, from, for, and with companies. And everybody has to accept, addressing the discussion just now, that you have to give away the control and the initiative to the industry. Because then they are forced to join forces and come with a common strategy, 
There is no interference of politics, whether it be here in Ontario or in Guelph, which is not so far away, by the way, or in Waterloo, for that matter, because it's their initiative, and they have to pay, and they have to do their homework, they have to derive a strategic agenda, etc., etc. We arranged it by a legal entity famous uh, all over the globe. It is a Dutch foundation under Dutch law. You can do basically anything you want under a foundation in my country. And we got the money from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. We talk a lot to the Ministry of Public Health. I'll dwell on that a little bit later on in my talk. We talk to Ag, Nature and Food Quality. We have been residing now for the past two years under the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Agriculture and Innovation. And since three weeks, we are back under a new name, the Ministry of Economic Affairs again. So for my call, and there is no, there is no official from the Netherlands, uh, if you were a marketing, you would probably have done this. Um, in terms of changing a name of a legal entity so many times in such a short time. That won't fly. So stick to the in initial names and leave it like that. Why do you innovate in the first place? Um, this is the uh, New York Stock Exchange graph of the total value of Apple versus Microsoft. And it was uh, in June 2010 that Apple got more worth than Microsoft. And it has stayed since then ever so, even when the turnover of Microsoft is 10 times the one of Apple. And there's a very simple reason for that. 80% of sales from Apple is from products that were launched in the past three years. I have been looking for data for the food industry. You're not going to get them at all. If you don't do that, you stay making the things that you always have been making fine with me, but there is only one trend in price, and I'm sorry about uh, the Dutch here, but in 1971 it was about 40 cents per kilo, and now it's down to 23. And the same holds for eggs. Wheat, wheat is a big commodity with some price fluctuation, but still, one trend, prices go down. Period. So talking about the return on investment of your innovation, if you don't do it, you choose deliberately to stay in that lane. Don't ask questions about return on investment, Louise, because there is none. Because you didn't do anything, there is no return. I found a data set at the Unova database com, actually also a company from Holland, it's the big competitor of Mintel from the United Kingdom, um, and they monitor product launches all over the globe. Canada is not there. Don't look for Canada. Um, so I simply took all the launches from their database, divided it by the number of inhabitants in the country, and I was pleasantly surprised that the Netherlands actually is the number one globally, and the often praised Japan is right there. So they're not so innovative at all. Now, I see you, and uh, any question on this graph? I'll ask it myself. Why did you put Estland, Letland, and Litauen all together? Well, uh, if you put Estland apart, it will have a figure of 1.7. <laughs> and I didn't like that idea. If you combine the three, then Netherlands is number one, so that's why I did. <laughs> and it fits nicely with saying, you know, innovation is a new product on the shelf. I admit immediately if uh, Tesco changes their color of their packaging, they will have like 10,000 new products on the shelf. But that holds for every country. And I'll be open for any new measurement to you know, be able to say something about the innovativity of a country. And I, nothing came up the past three years. Having said that, there is a, a nice report out two and a half years ago from our uh, leading national bank who described the food sector as if you are an SME, you're in the middle of a curve. And that's by definition an instable point, like that rock here. And either you choose to move down to cost leadership or efficient production, or you move towards the highly technically innovative company style. And it helped me a lot in, in looking at the data of my own program because being here obviously means you're innovative, and being here sounds like you're never going to survive again, but that's not true. They buy in their innovations. And that's 
a very sound strategy to me. Like you cannot afford as a smaller company to have all the right competencies to be innovative innovative, but you can partner up with others and they'll supply you. That could be your packaging guy, your machine builder and so on. And this has been in our sector for ages. Like uh, we co-innovate with other ingredients for example. Or if you are a grower you don't build the structure yourself, you buy that. Or the stable. Or the packaging material or the stainless steel, or the measurement and control unit, and so forth, and so forth. So co-innovation is the natural habitat of the food sector. There's even more. Now, for us, <coughs> the market, and these data are from 2009, it's now about 61 billion euros, going up to some 75 billion uh, Canadian dollars, I guess. The majority goes through the retail channel but not everything. There's also an out-of-home channel or food service, quite important, the restaurants, the catering, and the petrol channel. The good advice is go and eat out a lot in the somewhat better restaurants because there you will find chefs, chefs have a passion for nice products. Chefs have a passion and a feeling for novel things. So it's easy to communicate with those guys and if it's on their plate it will slowly trickle down to the consumers and actually I know because I talk a lot to the supermarket sector as well the innovation teams from super supermarkets go see what's going on in the delivery shops we have special retail channels for uh, out of home what's new on their shelves and they, they start buying it to offer it to their consumers makes sense right and I actually know one baker who does everything that a normal baker would never do. He bakes and then he uh, um, freezes his product and that's exclusively sold to restaurants and every three months our largest retailer Albert Heijn is coming to him if he wouldn't please sell it to them. Can you imagine that? The buyer of retail is coming to you rather than the other way around. That was great fun. Now, if you want to go there, you have to watch trends. And I can talk for hours, I will limit myself a little bit, pick out some favorites, but the trends in out of home are actually the ones that predict what will be going on in the sector for the next year or two. So this one's here, a normal thing is, is you know, upgraded to something special. The flexitarian is here to stay, like less meat, uh, vegetarian products. You have to offer real value. People don't want the cheap thing only. Uh, this is uh, buy one, get one free in my language. And this is a lot more profitable to make something special with the extra herbs and everything already in the package. Get connected to the consumer. Uh, this is a painful story actually. Uh, Lays, you all know probably from the US, they did a contest that any consumer could submit the new taste of the new crisps and could win 25,000 euros plus 1% of the turnover. The one that won this got a, a five-figure amount on his bank account, which is very much, even for our conditions. Now the winner was uh, this, patatje Joppie. Uh, patat is French fry in Dutch, and Joppie is actually the name of a horrible yellow sauce that is similar to what a well-known fast food chain is actually serving with their french fries and this is what the Dutch consumer liked very much. I'm so ashamed about it, but okay, it, <laughs> it worked like hell. You also see that everything is moving in towards a global trade and if you go out on the internet it takes you five minutes to find any kitchen anywhere in any city in the world. There's always a reaction. A reaction on regional and seasonal products, like this is a beer from San Francisco, only done in summer, it must be out of here in Canada, uh, and a nice basket full of regional products. The biggest issue probably is here, uh, which was also addressed this morning. This is the Unilever brand uh, with the margarine that helps you lower your cholesterol. I'm a user myself. This is the only blockbuster in functional food that there is on the globe. 
I know there's sales, I won't tell it here, but it's impressive. And then this local retailer, we have found just a tiny little hole in their patent portfolio. So now you can buy it as a white label product. And it's actually also sold at Aldi's at the moment in the Netherlands. And these, are, I took them in Walmart two years ago, the Unilever versus the Cheapo. And I have truckloads full of those pictures. This is uh, some, some gross stuff from the Netherlands. It's a yogurt with some fruit in it that you could eat or drink, whatever. Uh, and that's copied as well and so forth. The time on when to sell it, crucial. Don't know about you, but I'm a little bit busy. I work 25 hours a day, eight days a week. And then in the weekend, you know, then you start using your kitchen. So this Alsa is Unilever's brand in France. This is a, a cake in a pouch that you could put in your microwave and four minutes later you'll have a cake. They should have thrown in a little spray that makes your, hell, your house smell like as if you were baking a cake, but... <laughs> okay, this is from Spain. This is a, a hamburger with the nice pre-grilled uh, stripes on it, also microwavable, one minute and 15 seconds later. And this is the ultimate thing coming from Germany. It is basically a separator meat from pork that they have battered and you put the entire thing in your bread roaster. And that's a snack uh, eaten by Germans. 60 tons per week in Germany. It's getting pretty big. And from South Africa, a, um, a soda that tells you if you drink me, you have the feeling like as if you had a cigarette with the subtle no warning needed underneath. There was a famous uh, cigarette producer that didn't like that concept, so it's off the market now. <laughs> And then the weekends comes, and there you get the, the other channel, as I call it, fresh products like the Romanesco here, truckloads full of different tomato varieties, cheeses, and this is taken in Les Halles in Paris, the mecca of the European culinary interested person, uh, fresh fish. And then you cook. And consumers can spend. We're the only sector with this, this Pancake effect. If you make a pancake, which is the Dutch culinary attribution to the world's heritage, uh, it will cost you like five cents. You can go to the retail store, get them pre-cooked, it will cost you 50 cents each. You can go to a restaurant, get one specifically made for you, it costs you five euros. That's a factor of 100, right? For the same product. Imagine this with a car or a cell phone. It's crazy. The guy that understood that really well is a good friend of mine. He has a, a greenhouse where he grows seeds into little sprouts. One of them is wheatgrass. And then you take a bundle of that, you put it in a little machine that he imports from Korea, and you get a, a fingertip full of wheatgrass juice, and that's sold in gyms and workout areas for an incredible amount of money. And he says, this is very healthy. I tasted it. It makes you really think that you have just ingested something very healthy. <laughs> um, and then to my big surprise, my last visit to the U.S. was uh, I found this uh, wheat grass juice from the Evergreen Company, produced in Canada actually. And then you can break off one cup, digest that, and you're a very healthy person. If you turn the package around, you see this. This is the U.S. labeling. <laughs> There's only zeros. There's basically nothing in that, <laughs> in that shit. I'm fantastic. It works like hell. Then one of the companies you should have a look at is uh, Innocent Drinks from the UK. They were the first to do a fully recycled plastic bottle for their drinks. Now, they're all in the food industry. That was a hell of a job, but they succeeded in that. Organic is here to stay. Better make the best of it. If you eat fish, you should have it under the uh, Marine Stewardship Council logo for sustainably caught fish. Um, fat replaces and meat replaces are big, are growing really very fast at the moment. There's a truckload of those companies in, uh, in the Netherlands. And if you sell, don't sell the product, sell the experience. This is the most successful out-of-home chain called Laplace in Holland. You're buying orange juice, but actually you're buying the total orange experience, right? Which sells a lot more. 
I have never seen a, disc, a, a qualifier move into a disqualifier in the speed that we saw the last two, three years. You have to arrange your back office. You have to be sure about your water use, its energy, all the inputs, closing the cycle and reuse your waste because the consumer takes it for granted that you did that. If you don't do it, you're in trouble. <coughs> and then the major issue, health. I don't know about Canada, but I can imagine it's pretty much the same. Uh, our bodies are ours in Holland. And the government has nothing to do with that. And that's why companies respond by giving information on the content of the energy or the fat or whatever in their product. It has to be a true story. The first one, and I'm not sponsored by Unilever, uh, this is the Dove campaign. If you Google back on that, there was an earthquake in marketing country. This is how the Dutch women look like, ladies and gentlemen. Those are real women, no models. So real products for real women. Dove New Zealand, you could just register online as a woman to be the next model. There was an inside joke within Unilever about this campaign, but I can reveal that over lunch and won't do it publicly. And what happened to this? Those of you having kids, the first spoon in the mouth of your children is a very, very, very special moment. We are selling love, ladies and gentlemen. It better be good. If you get that right, you come up with creative things like this. Once again, Innocent Drinks in the UK. They do a contest each winter that their customers knit a hat. They can put that in an envelope, send it to Innocent Drinks Limited, and at the end of the bottling line, they put the hats on their bottles. And for each hat, they donate 50p to a organization that helps, apparently, the older UK citizen through winter time. I, I like the concept, I just didn't understand that, but that's it. How many hats do you think? United Kingdom only, each winter. And there's a truckload full of different hats on their website, all very nice. How many? 60 million people in the UK. Five million. You never tried an action like this, right? Paulus, come on, no. 600,000. 600,000 customers needing a hat to put on their bottle. Isn't that amazing? I mean, they will be drinking that forever. My favorite trend is this one. This is the new uh, Starbucks. And it's actually a tea. This is Argo tea from Chicago. If you go to uh, O'Hare, uh, you go there, you'll actually see a shop of them. I'm not an expert in that area, but I'm told that the look and feel of this shop is totally feminine. You only see women actually in that shop because men drink coffee, women drink tea, right? And this brings me to the big thing that is happening all the time, it's the feminization. Those are pictures that 10 years ago were impossible. Ah, they're using computers rather than selling them. They're even playing a weird sport with a ball uh, called football. They're not sitting on, but driving in the car. And uh, this is in Dutch, it says women have the power. And the time where it all had to be pink and, and, and light green is way gone. And that is because they're well trained, they have a lot more taste on average than the men do. They know what they want and they have money to spend. Do I hear a big audience? Yes, sir. And the men, we're still there. <laughs> but we eat meat and we drink beer, and the ultimate one is this package from the United States, again, hungry man with 454 grams of steak in one package. That's the toxic doses, ladies and gentlemen. There's one exception to the rule that marketing is not throwing meat or beer at men. Does anybody know which one that is? Dutchies, anybody? No? There it is. That one. That's the only food aimed at men specifically, not being beef or meat. I see opportunities. There are a lot of guys out there 
with taste and willingness to spend money. But, okay, who am I? Being at the issue, there is distinct... <laughs> yeah, 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 this happened before, this happened before. Uh, this needs no explanation, right? But what we figured out with the restaurant of the future, that actually exactly the same thing is happening in a catering situation. The guys know after three days where the soup is and their favorite little snack. So after three days, they walk to the soup, take the snack, and go to the counter, right? Women don't do that ever. It doesn't matter what you offer. They keep looking day in, day out for all the things that are there. So the very simple conclusion, if there is a new catering situation, look at the gender situation in the office, because if you have more women, you need a bigger restaurant. Otherwise, it will get too crowded. Just to take Homer. Also, the buying motivation. You were absolutely right with your uh, low gluten. This is new from Tatel Nile. And what you see, of course, 80% is not willing to buy less taste. Makes kind of sense to me, you know. But the shock was that 50% reads the label. And only 10 years ago, it was only 25%. Nobody basically gave a damn. Now, people read ingredients, need nutritional information, they want fiber, vitamins, and antioxidants. And it's all out there on the internet, right? So what we discussed some six, seven years ago, health is here to stay, sustainability is upcoming fast, but it is moving from a qualifier to a disqualifier. So you have to do the homework, but making a selling propo proposition out of it is quite difficult. And the program that we run was about creating opportunities, not being threatened by government. Why did the government bother? First of all, it has to do something with the sector. This is our national cookie, by the way, the stroopwafel, for those of you who like sweets. And it has something to do with health. Now, these are the data. Uh, this one can be remembered by politicians. It's 10% of GDP, 600,000 jobs. And then you can throw in the extras for the packaging and the machinery, etc., etc. My lesson learned, nobody in the government gave a damn. They're just not interested. They were interested when we came up with this. And this is not a very nice message for the industry. But a lot of diseases are <coughs> food related. And we spend a fortune, 5 billion euros, in the Netherlands alone to fight the effects of wrong diets. And after that, I could present this to our Prime Minister, looked him straight in the eyes, said, Mr. President, how much do you want to take off that figure? 10%, 15%, 20%? Any investment in better food pays off in public health. That was the key message. And I, the nice show is there, uh, dirty pictures. Obesity, for one, this is a US picture. It's two women and one man, for that matter. And to make it gender neutral, I throw in this one as well. Um, and it can be depicted very shortly. <clears throat> the David from Michelangelo was lent to the US, and after two years it came back, and it looked like that, right? <laughs> That's the only nasty data set I have. You've probably seen it. This is the uh, CDC data set. America is actually very lucky. They only have one uh, organization that measures stuff like that for the entire uh, United States area. And they depicted how many percent of the people had a body mass index over 30. For the non-insiders, this is 27 and a half. I'm a healthy guy. I, walk, I, I really look in what I put in my mouth. BMI over 30 basically is clinically ill. And you get disease and everything. And after that, they did it every year. I hope. few minutes. I need more. Well, it's one generation, and you end up with every third American being obese. This is what's going on in the States. I don't know about Canada. It costs them $170 billion a year 
and of course there is a diet industry, but that's kind of cynical. And the American Army intervened two years ago saying, we, we have too little fit recruits. So it's a matter of national security. I'm happy not to be a public health official in the States anyway. Europe, uh, we have a data set that stops rather early in 2005. This is the females, once again the gender thing. If you look at Portugal, this by the way is the Netherlands. If you look at Portugal, uh, you see what happens to the males. You see that actually women get more fat than men, which was a surprise to me. So this is what's going on. At the same time, where do you think 40% of people going into hospitals are malnutrition? I actually have a picture to help you. It's with us. So you have an undernutrition situation and an overnutrition situation at the same time. It's really incredible. Why should companies bother? A very, very basic, it means new business. And being from the Netherlands, uh, this is chocolate for injection. So not anything else that you might think of. It just means new business, period. What we did, and we started a bit longer ago, 16 years. If you are into funnels, which I'm not anymore, there will always be a fuzzy front end with fundamental and then in a few steps you go here where the market is, right? We have one entity called the Top Institute for Food and Nutrition with the payoff scientific excellence with industrial relevance. To address the fundamental science question, the citation indexes within the work from the Top Institute are higher than the citation indexes outside the Top Institute. So this is truly deeply excellent work paid for partly by industry. And we had Food Nutrition Delta with a much shorter time frame which was driven by the business opportunity. So, and then there is another area because finally the company has to invest, period, for something new and you can't help there. We were lucky in Holland, we have quite a few big companies that could set the long-term vision, which means 20 years from now. And this is not coming from science. Science is looking for the next PhD student. This is not coming from governments, because they by definition don't look longer than four years. This is coming from industry. And we develop the knowledge to be able to meet those needs. At the same time, we get the SMEs in for the market pool and the short-term dynamics. Now, this is the area of interest, and this is the area where you have to conclude after five years that a lot of knowledge is generated that will never make it to market, and that there are a lot of questions from market that are not addressed in science. And that's where you can start working on, right? How did we do it? We looked at the consumer needs in 20 years, and those are all those things. Once more, addressing, it has to taste great. If it doesn't, forget about it. If you take out one quality of life for the elderly, we defined the needs. What is it? You break your bones, you don't taste that well, your muscles go down and you sleep bad. I'm looking forward to grow older than I am now. We checked if the market was larger than one billion, global. If it wasn't, the whole idea was thrown out again. From all of this, you can derive the functional targets. From the functional targets, you reshuffle, you get the scientific targets, and then you run the program and you hire the PhDs and the professors. There is one PhD here working on the question of what is the effect of the flexibility of the cell lines in intestinal guts from people above 75 and their health. The chance that an SME company comes with that question is nil. Uh, it never happened to me. You, know, you can never say it's nil, but that won't happen. But you need that in order to create the new things for the upcoming years, right? So these are the partners, some quite uh, famous logos here, both science providers, but also a truckload of companies increasing rapidly from the international field. So we have them from the US, we have them from France, Switzerland, uh, and Denmark. Do they come there for free? No, they can buy a ticket in a theme. There are seven themes, I think. One ticket costs 300,000 euros cash on the bank of the institute. 
and you have to give a commitment for four years. So that's 1.2 million. So you better be sure. What do you get? You share it with others. You get some extra money from the know-how providers and you get some extra money from the Dutch government. So the leverage for a Canadian dollar would be around 18 to 20, what you get back in volume for your investment. Quite successful formula. Um, for food and nutrition deltas, we also have all these companies on board, but an extra uh, close to 400 companies after five years, of which over 90% are SMEs. And we worked, since we start with the company's question, with 22 knowledge providers, of which six are foreign, of which one actually comes from Canada. If you would redesign the system, you would never come up with 22 knowledge providers. But if you start with the company's question, you go, look, where is it already available, or where is the largest chance of success, then this is what you end up, factual. We stayed with our we call them instruments, as close as possible to the companies. This is what you want. You want your idea tested, see if it's feasible, and then do a project, normally. Then you pick up the phone, and if I translate it to Canadian situations, you call Guelph University, and then everything goes berserk, because every knowledge provider usually says that you, they will have the answer for your problem. And that's why we threw in a broker, or an innovation coach that you could call for help. If you didn't like it, you apply for a project yourself. What did they do? They built the consortium and bring the parties together and a little bit help create the project proposal. What do you look for? Guys like this with 30 years of experience in a single area within the food sector. There's one for steel, there's one for ingredients, there's one for health, and so forth. They didn't have an office, they had a car and a mobile phone. And I hired them from their jobs for usually half time. So they were not on my payroll. It worked. This is the end of the story uh, for Food Nutrition Delta. 90% um, SME, I said that this is what we spend on feasibility innovation projects for SME and big innovation projects. And the money actually went to SMEs, and not to larger or to knowledge providers. This is an extrapolated statement, but I think we're quite close to that. With all those companies, we have created over 3,000 jobs in the country, which is not bad. And this is a take home or two. If you move into the area where you are defining the new business, don't create big clusters. You're not going to negotiate with your competitor what you are going to do in three years, basically. So if you count the number of partners, two and three is accounting for over 90% of the projects that we did, which makes sense to me because you're defining it with your provider. It could be a university, it could be a new machine, it could be a new packaging, etc. And that was it. That's what you do. Well, this was addressed by Youp, I think. We have a big companies, good knowledge infrastructure, and a whole lot more. I have a few examples. How much time do I have, Louise? We're almost there. Oh my god. This is the, the dairy sector. We threw in iron in the milk, specifically aimed at women, specifically aimed at the Asian market, because there are quite a lot of women that lack iron there. There is a guy who is uh, actually an egg farmer, and he is now adding pharmaceuticals in his eggs through the nutrition, through the feed. This is a project that won an innovation award recently. This is a guy who burns tiny little holes in plastic. And the plastic is used to package vegetables and fruit. Very tiny. This is done in line on existing equipment. And what he does as an extra, and this is where we supported him, he has a respiration chamber to measure the specific respiration needs of a product in the chamber so that he can design the number of holes and the frequency of the holes and the size of the holes. So you measure that, you get that, put in a computer, the computer is actually linked to the laser and the laser is controlled by a microscope and that's what you get. Shelf life in total is extended by about seven days for packed products like this, which is basically double the time that they usually are spent in the shelf. 
He has a launching customer in the UK, being Marks and Spencers, there are worse. And uh, they got a 40% reduction in losses from the products that had to be taken off the shelf because they were gone. One call out, please come and visit gatewaytofood.nl. You can register as an expert. If you're in the provider business, you're welcome to register there. We did already projects with Canada, and we could love to have more. If you're looking for experts, go there and find. What it does, it will help you looking for it. This is juice, and then it comes with suggestions that are not semantically linked, but linked based on content of the industry. Um, I'll skip this, because the officials that want to do it, we did provide feasibility projects which lasted one year, and we threw in 50,000 euros at the applier. And there were at least two partners in those projects. And I have a load of these instruments, but that can be done later, I suppose. You want to talk about competencies? Oh my, well, the difficulty, I think, and this was a presentation by Tim Cook from ISIS in Oxford, that if you want to mix and make such a cluster, you have to talk with industry, government officials. If it's dealing with startups, there are investors uh, and researchers from industry. So he said, you need intermediates with experience in all those areas. This is only the commercial access, which is basically turning research into product and the academics, which is basically turning money into research. That's what they do. If there's an investor involved, you get another projection there. And the investor is making more money out of money, not more than that. If you look at all those competencies, and there are four which you cannot uh, do uh, projected. You have two insiders actually working on the subject, you have two outsiders, the investor and the public official. There's one major interest here, there's one company interest here, there are a lot of activities for the investor, there seems to be one government, but there are a lot of ministries, conflicting. For the academic researcher, the route is not defined at the start. For the industry, you have a coordinated plan and a coherent activity for the things you are doing. The investor has a total different scheme, and a government official is actually spending. A different angle. And the most interesting part, if the academic finds something that's not working, you go find a workaround. Am I right? You're smiling, I'm right. At industry, if it's not working, bloody well, fix it. And the investor, if it's not working, get the hell out of there. And the public official, if it's not working, <laughs> pretend it still is. <laughs> so what we did, I only have three, because the investor part is coming right now. Uh, find a guy who's crazy enough to spend his life working like this. You start at the business end, and then you, in a daily life, interfere with all the others. And you end at the business side as well. But I made that point when I started. If you talk about public health, I had to show this picture in the United States on demand one and a half years ago. This is the campaign in Denmark to promote eating fruits and vegetables. Yes, you see what you're seeing. <laughs> and why did they do that? Because this is very close to the Danish nature. Did it work? <laughs> they got a 43% increase with this campaign in the consumption of fruit and vegetables. There is no other campaign in this world that had that high an increase. Extremely effective. I was presenting in the US, by the way, because they just launched the new guidelines. And uh, I said, you know, it, it might work in California, but it would not probably be a success in Tennessee. But OK. The UK, another example, they had a sit the slug salt reduction campaign with truckloads full of organizations uh, attached to it. And then later, this is once again from the ANOVA database, you see that the largest number of product introduction with a lower salt claim are actually in the UK. And the second best in Europe was France with only 7%. Now if you can link those two activities together, 
So public health officials are talking to industry what they are going to do to influence the public health. Industry can respond much quicker by launching the right products. That would make that campaign, public money, a lot more effective. This is my dream. We don't do it in the Netherlands. They think it's spooky, but it works. I'm pretty much convinced. These are all your questions I'm addressing, right? It's, it's just your problem. <laughs> IPR, time to market, and business model. Those are three of the different things that you have as a steering wheel, right? This is, in the food sector, probably the most important one. And this, probably the less important one, and this is up to you, what you choose. They, they interact. My thing is, if you are looking at something new with a big impact, or a big investment, or for a big company, move to IPR. Go patent. If you don't, if it's a chip change, a low investment, or you're talking to an SME, focus on that one. Do it with an NDA. It's much easier, much quicker, and everybody's happy. And then the role of training. This is the final question that you posed. Um, you all know this scheme, probably. The life cycle of innovation starts with the idea, then the constraints, the technicalities, the legal issues, management indecision, and then eventually it's branded like it was the original idea where this is the actual product. I just want to point out to that one, management in decision. If the top of the company, be it big or small, is not interested and is not actually pursuing the innovation process, don't even think about starting it because it will never fly. That is why my title is Chief Inspiration Officer and not CEO, which I am, but nobody cares. If you be innovative in the things you do, then it can work. Innovation, ladies and gentlemen, you can learn how to swim by sitting next to the pool and reading the book on how to swim. You can also just dive in the water, start doing it. Once again, to be gender neutral, there's a hunk for the ladies. Just do it. Don't argue too much. This is what helps. Au Japon, on consomme peu de graisse et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux États-Unis. En France, on consomme beaucoup de graisse et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux États-Unis. En Inde, on boit peu de vin rouge et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux États-Unis. En Espagne, on boit beaucoup de vin rouge et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux États-Unis. Au Brésil, on fait beaucoup plus l'amour qu'en Algérie et le nombre d'infarctus des deux pays est plus faible qu'aux États-Unis. Conclusion, buvez, mangez, faites l'amour autant que vous voulez. Ce qui peut tuer, c'est de parler anglais. This is actually telling you that uh, people drink more red wine in Brazil than in Argentina, and, and still there are more deaths in the United States, and so on and so on, and it all melts down. The things that can kill you is actually speaking English, so you should speak French. <laughs> but it doesn't work, so next time, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, sure. We have the same trends in obesity. We have the same maps uh, here in Canada. That's the first one. Second one is uh, uh, with respect to the public health side, how much interaction do you have with the public health officials and industry? Uh, Quite a lot. In the new structure that we're building, uh, there are two government representatives at the upper level of the, of the ministries. Uh, one of them is from economic affairs and the other is from public health. The argument being, first of all, then they see what is actually happening in industry. Think about that. She's sitting there, at, it's a woman, she's sitting there at the table looking at the investment we make in R&D for better products. That's the best argument I can give you. Here, here in Canada, we have, or here in Ontario, we did have the public health agency for not the uh, Ontario. We had, we had an Ontario Ministry of Public Health. Ministry of Health Promotion. Health Promotion, that's it, thank you. And it, it was, it's now part of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And there's a disconnect between the food industry and, and those ministries. We have a great connection with OMAFRA, which is our Food and Rural Affairs, and with Agriculture and Agriculture Canada. We have 
very little connection with the wealth business. See it as an opportunity. It's all food, right? I mean, any other? Hey, all hungry, right? Can you address uh, Steve's question on the two besides where this is going to happen? Um, as I said, where I started with, if industry can come with a plan together and you can persuade the government to give away the initiative, you can overrule all kind of local initiatives and, and other issues. There's one thing certain to me, you know, you can develop the know-how, you can put money in pilots, uh, you can do campaigns for public health. If the food industry is not moving along, nothing will ever happen. And it's all a waste of money. So the initiative is with the sector. You better take it, you better take it fast. You're welcome.